need to get people to dream about what democracy really looks like. Just to take a quick hit on this, I'm a historian of constitutional amendments. I've written about all these struggles. There have been literally dozens of amendments to overturn the Electoral College. There have been so many on all these different things. I actually think the best amendment is every American has a right to vote and a right to have that vote counted. One line, be done with it. But I understand that there's going to be debates. We, Rashad and I have actually, we've seen these debates literally in Congressman Pocan and Congressman Ellison's offices already. And one of the things that we have to be very, very careful about as reformers is to not come from a place of excess powerlessness, not come from a place of thinking, you know, this doesn't matter. It does matter what we develop. I see a woman from the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters torture you. Every time you put forward a proposal, they make you put it through a thousand gradations and you got to put proposals before they will endorse it. I will tell you this. I want over the next year or so to see the development of a right to vote amendment that will be that will pass the League of Women Voters and get past their muster. And we will come to that place. But at, as you say, at this point of dreaming, if we rush to if we get into fights over the, the specifics of it, we run the risk of a debate within our powerlessness, right? We, we argue among ourselves on the periphery, which is exactly where power wants us. No, where we ought to be is demanding a right to vote every single day, whether it's in a new Voting Rights Act, whether it's in a right to vote amendment, whether it's statutory at the state or national or local level. But the bottom line is that making the noise about it, making the noise about that right to vote will create the space in which all of the other reforms come. Anybody, anybody disagree with the? Um, let me just uh, great. Let, let me just uh, turn to some of the questions from the from the audience. Um, one one person asked, "What will a voting rights amendment afford voting rights advocates that they can't get via legislation or litigation?" I mean, in other words, what would it really make possible? Uh, so, just I think the one one of the things it gets back to this. Um, how courts review restrictions to voting. Um, we have seen, as I mentioned, you know, from the Bush v. Gore case to the Indiana case, the courts look at um, whether or not a restriction on voting really is, is reasonable, um, which is a very low standard of review in a federal court case. What we really need is that there should be a compelling state interest. If there had been a compelling state interest in the Indiana voter ID case, they would not have won that case because there actually was no evidence of voter fraud. Um, there was none. It was written in a dissent. By the way, there was no evidence. Um, in Pennsylvania, you know, although our case is a state court case, again, you know, when we have seen these voter ID restrictions come forth, mm -hmm. while we've been told that it's about voter fraud, there has been no evidence in any of these states that have passed it that that's actually the reason. Um, in Pennsylvania, the, you know, you have the representative Terzai who, who actually exposed what it was about. It was about trying to win the election for their guy. And so I think one of the things that we think is just, I mean, as someone who has litigated cases, voting rights cases, for a few years, um, <laughs> we really need to get back to looking at strict scrutiny. Having these states have to have a real compelling reason why they are rolling back our right to participate in democracy. Um, if I could jump in with a, a local uh, connection to that. Um, I, the other reason it matters is because it's about going on offense instead of on defense. And at a local level, uh, let me give an example from Maryland. Maryland, the state legislature recently passed an ethics disclosure law that applies to any of the municipal officials like myself in 150 municipalities. What that means is that we now have annual meetings where we sit down and we try to figure out how we're going to comply with this, how we're going to do a better job, what's the right form to use. It creates momentum. And that's the same thing that would happen if you had a right to vote amendment to the Constitution. At, even at the very local level, um, elected officials, and, and, and many are good. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to speak up for myself and, and many other people that I know. They try to figure out how to do a good job of what uh, voters expect of them. 
And so something like that creates a positive expectation. It means you know, we should be thinking about this year and the next year and over a five-year period, right. how are we going to get better at encouraging participation? Yeah. And it would do that. Ask, ask yourself this simple question. What has extended from the right to freedom of speech? What has extended from the right to the freedom to assemble, to petition? What has extended from the right to form a militia? All, every right that is detailed in the Constitution is like a seed that is planted. It extends, we, be, we grow from it. And the crisis of the last several decades has been that we've seen a chipping away at the right to vote in the United States. We need to plant that seed. We need to put it in the Constitution explicitly defined. And then, yes, we need judges to say, yes, it's in the Constitution. You have to, go, you have to extend it to some place. It has to go somewhere. And the fact of the matter is, I don't necessarily think we have to define the right to vote in the amendment. We have to say it exists. And then we have to have our faith. And I know it's sometimes hard these days. We have to have a certain faith in the judiciary that just as when we define other rights, over time they grow and they extend. The fact that it's not in the Constitution has haunted us throughout for 226 years. It's time to put it in the Constitution and end that haunting. Any other thoughts on that before I? Um, next question is a good one. It's a very long question. I'm just I'm going to sum it up as uh, the person asks. Um, person says that obviously opponents of a constitutional right to vote probably have political reasons for opposing it, um, but, but they have to offer something else. What would be their strongest argument? What's the strongest argument you've heard in opposition to a constitutional amendment on a right to vote, and how do you engage with it? Well, I, I guess the strongest. Can people hear me with that? We need it for the recording. Uh, uh, Hold it out. <laughs> Echo. And, OK, great. Thank you. Um, so what we've heard a lot is um, that we already have this right. Um, so you hear that over and over again. Um, speaking of opponents, I mean, Scalia has said we don't have this right So in, in Bush v. Gore. So I think in terms of like opponents to the things that, that um, we want at Color of Change, um, there's probably not a better opponent than, than Scalia, who actually has made the case why we actually need a constitutional amendment, because he said we don't. Um, the right to vote, um, but we've heard from folks who are who 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 are who are natural allies on a lot of on a, on a wide range of issues, and, and who we work with on a wide range of things, talk about that um, we already have this right, or that the the goals sort of in response to this moment should be different in terms of congressional fixes and 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 um, work at the state level and. Um, and I don't disagree with them that we should be doing those things at the congressional level, or those state fixes. And I think this goes back to both points that John and Judy have made around us being aspirational and being bigger and thinking bigger. And you know, after Citizens United happened, there were a lot of very smart people that went right to disclosure um, as sort of the response to this. It was not. Um, it was not sort of a. Uh, a policy or a goal that met the moment of what of what the Supreme Court did in terms of corporate power, in, 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 and we still don't have it, um, and we don't have a strong movement. Um, while there were many people that also went bigger for a constitutional amendment and are, and are continuing that work, a lot of a lot of energy went towards fixes, and so to the extent that um, as progressives and as as people who who, who want to sort of advance the, the values that we want to achieve, we can't be afraid to do it. And we can't be afraid to talk about the things that we want. And we can't, and we can't think that um, we're going to get John Boehner, who can't pass a farm bill, to like, do a whole lot on voting rights. I wanted to um, add, I think, I mean, one of the, one of the other, um, big pieces around this is um, is the state's rights piece. And really that, um, that elections and who gets to vote and participate in our election really should be governed by local decisions and local control. I mean, it is a continuation of like our thinking about the war of northern aggression, quite frankly. We're stuck on it. 
And as a country, we see ourselves also as a republic and not a democracy. And so each one of these states gets to have their own rule about how we're all going to participate in the union. And I think, you know, it's also the, this disdain for Washington, um, the disdain for federal government control over what should happen back home, even when it comes to, you know, a decision about how elections should be run, federal elections should be run, right? About like who, how we vote for president, how we vote for the Senate, how we vote for Congress. Um, there are folks who believe that who gets to vote and how it gets to be done should be decided back home. And so until we kind of see ourselves as a real union mm -hmm. and as folks who are in this together and we get over the war of Northern aggression and the fact that black folks are free now, <laughs> um, we really have a problem. Um, and we have to see this as we're all in it together. And could you, oh, just jump that for one sec, because it's so important. The, the one thing that does go, you know, Voting Rights Act was a wonderful issue, and it was a, a, a crowning jewel of the civil rights movement, yeah. and yet it wasn't a national act. It was an act targeted towards specific states. And the fact of the matter is that when, you know, when I, we, I did a book on the Florida recount fight, and I, I thought I knew everything about all this stuff, and then I looked at where the highest level of discarded votes were in 2000. It wasn't in Florida. It was in Illinois. It was in a state that wasn't under the Voting Rights Act and that sent, you know, was short order going to send Barack Obama to the U.S. Senate. And so the fact of the matter is that that need for a universal fix, that need for something national, becomes so vital because we get too comfortable blaming the South. We get too comfortable saying, well, the South has got, you know, has this history, it has these problems. The fact of the matter is we have huge voting rights aggressions and huge voting rights denials in northern and western states yeah. that we think of as relatively progressive. Can I, can I push back on this a little bit? I mean, obviously, I think it's correct. The, the, the most outrageous thing about Shelby County was this affirmation that states' rights to be treated exact, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to not have a federal imposition on them based on their past behavior was somehow uh, more important than individuals' right to vote. That's a big deal. On the other hand, you know, we've heard from Tim and and uh, and Patty and 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 other, and also from John and and, and Mark Hoken about localities and states like Wisconsin that have made huge steps forward in allowing early voting and in allowing same day registration and so forth. Do you, is is there a little concern that if we sort of locked in place? A set of standards, say, you know, the way th the sort of norms of voting 15 years ago, um, that we actually would have less opportunity for states to move forward in a good way uh, to open up. Voting. Well, I, th I think it's if you if you decide that you have standards as a as a floor, not a ceiling, right? Yeah. So if you want to expand the franchise, go ahead and do it, mm -hmm. right? But not to restrict it, right? And so if we have that bottom floor, mm -hmm. and then Folks in Tacoma Park can lead the way, and you know. Our and, friend and was talking about sixteen-year-old right. voting, that's right. right? And that's right. that's taking it the next exactly. step. And that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, we, we need a we need a national standard, but um, that standard doesn't have to be um, as far as we can progress. And also, um, as far as uh, the question goes, as far as what we feel has been um, has been the pushback to the right to vote amendment. To me, it's been people just don't think we can do it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why even work on that? Focus on the symptom. But I feel like the fact that you know what what recently happened with the Voting Rights Act decision, like that just shows that just focusing on the symptoms isn't going to cure the problem. So um, I think that a, a lot of the a lot of our strategy needs to refocus, look at a constitutional amendment, or at least make that our, our end goal. We can work on, on, on these problems that come up on voting rights um, violations, but, but we need to do that in the spirit of um, actually enshrining a right to vote in the Constitution and making that a, a national right. I mean, I always think I, a, a real, it's good. Look, I, I mean, I think the problem is that, that when we look at the laws that were passed in 2011 and 2012, they really, they were about making it harder to vote. And like, we have to start with a premise that it should be easy, it should be fair, voting should be accessible to all, right? And that anything that you do that makes it harder for someone to vote. And I mean, and, think, and then add to it that our election system 
is so archaic. I mean, you know, like, the, you know, like step into this century, right? And realize that we have computers. So like, you know, elections could be run very easily so that you should be able to vote. If you're in a state or I'm in Prince George's County, Maryland, I actually should be able to go vote at any place, right? There should be a computer that I, they pull up what my ballot is and ta-da! Um, and I go to the place that has the least amount of people in line. And so I think we have to come at this from... The, the idea that it, voting should be free, fair, and accessible to all. And just to follow on that, because you're going to scare some of our friends who worry about verified voting when you say <laughs> computers. And, uh, and I actually, I, I'm old school. I actually like, you know the place where they, they vote fastest and count them fastest? Paper ballots in Britain. I've watched it. You know, it's amazing. They get the whole election done in one night, recounts everything. So the fact of the matter is, I, I'm not sure the technology is the, is essential here, although it, it certainly has possibility. But the, the one thing is, I, I think the best way to understand a constitutional amendment is like a ladder. And, you know, if you want to get someplace, and you want to climb up, you need a ladder to climb up. But you also have to put that ladder on something solid, right? Right now, we've got saturated ground. We've got mud there. And if we put that, try to go up, that, it slides down into that mud sometimes. We're not necessarily always climbing. Eric Foner, the great historian, says that, that the right to vote in this country has been an eternal struggle from the founding of the republic. It's gone back and forth. It's never, it's never been locked in. And, and the reason it goes back and forth is not because of nefarious people. It's worse than that. It goes back and forth because of something called politics. Yep. And, and Democrats and Republicans look for positions where they can use that amorphous moment, that that mud, that, that kind of saturated ground to push the ladder down or pull it up a little bit. We've got to end that. We ought to put a nice little base there that says everybody's got a right to vote, right to have that vote counted. And then if people want to climb that ladder all the way, all the way to the higher ground, fantastic. If they just want to have it at that base place, well, that's where we're going to be. But the fact of the matter is that, that it's the fluidity of it, it's the uncertainty of it that is more a problem, Mark, I would suggest, than, than anything else, because we lie to ourselves that we've made progress. And, and we have. we made wonderful progress, historic progress. We teach it in our schools. And then we suddenly realize, wow, it's not nearly as locked in as we thought. There, are, there were four nominees for the US Senate, all Republican nominees, in 2012 who favored getting rid, or at least were entertained the idea of getting rid of an elected US Senate. So we should not presume that these things are settled. I mean, I, and I just picking up on that point, I think, you know, the point around the, the, the senators is a good one, that I agree with you that, that when you have elected leaders who, who then get to make the rules about how, the, how to get into the game that they're in, um, it, it becomes challenging. But there shouldn't be like, a, and I don't think that's just what you were doing, but I don't want us to have a false equivalency of like, kind of the left does it and the right does it and it's in it's the, because what we've seen you know with these this is a Shelby case and and what we saw with the attacks on voting was a direct response to the rising American electorate the the coalition of 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 young folks of Latinos of black folks that elected and reelected President Obama and the demographic shifts that we've seen in this country it was a it was a direct attack and hit at that group um, and um, and we should like make no mistake about other progress that we've seen on other fronts right the the fact of the matter is is that um, we would not have seen gay marriage pass in all those states had there not been a rising American electorate that was able to vote because the Voting Rights Act was in place and enforced and um, and so um, to the extent that um, to the extent that we um, need to be very clear that um, that you know that the, this next 10, 15, 20 years is going to be incredibly important um, to us realizing um, the impact of this electorate uh, and, and the things that we do to ensure that people actually have the ability to participate and the way in which we message what our democracy should look like as new people are coming in and participating, and we give people something to be for and get them around something bigger 
and, and bolder and, and more visionary than sort of tactical fixes or tactical um, pieces, that is going to be what, what holds, what, what allows us to realize and leverage the success of, of this moment and, um, and of, of an America that is looking different and, and could be different. Just to follow up on that quickly and to respond to something Patty said earlier, I mean, I think the, I think one question to ask about a constitutional amendment, because they will always be difficult and they'll always take a lot of time, is how much good work can happen during the during that process? Oh, right. How much right. how much That's goes right. in its wake? You know, so to me, the constitutional right to vote amendment looks a lot like the equal rights amendment. You know, in that the the, the in the not passing the equal rights amendment in the end was a lot less significant than all the other work that came in its way, the establishment of state councils on the status of women and all kinds of things. And it's a <coughs> way of making people understand that the right to vote is a contested right. It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is in play, it is muddy, as John said. Um, that's gonna give people a lot of power, I think, to think about other things. I'm gonna maybe conclude, I think, with one uh, question from the audience uh, of somebody who wanted to go even further and, uh, and wanted to ask about, uh, about the Australian system, which includes mandatory voting and 95% of, of people vote and, and, and how you all feel about that. I'm gonna add a quick, a quick note before, before you answer that question. I was with some Australians the other day who complained their country was, was, ter was falling apart, the bad party was taking over, blah, blah, blah. And then they told me the bad part, that the uh, concern, that what's called the Liberal Party, but it was actually the Conservative Party, um, their proposal was for uh, uh, 30 weeks paid sick leave. Yeah, and I I, and, but it was only at the minimum wage. Well, what's the minimum wage? It's sixteen dollars an hour. So there's a lot to be said. It was, for a, brutal, us. It was yeah. a brutal circumstance. Yeah, <laughs> a lot to be said. I, co I covered the last Australian election, and they were debating, you know, one party to do universal broadband build out free of charge for everybody, and the other party would have like a minimal charge. Right. And you know, and I was thinking, wow. Uh, anyway, let me voting. let me start a mandatory voting. I, I don't favor mandatory voting. I favor the Australian system. Australia, intriguingly enough, doesn't exactly have mandatory voting. They allow people to opt out if they have a, a good reason not to. And in fact, you know, many of the countries that have explored or done mandatory voting around the country do it in a very libertarian, very conservative way, which is we give you a tax credit if you vote. You get a little, you go vote, you get, you can staple something to your taxes and get a hundred bucks off or get something off. America seems to like tax credits. Great. I favor a tax credit. I want, but I do want to. I want to do everything possible to encourage voting, because the fact of the matter is, I'm willing to roll my dice on a mass electorate. And countries that have Australian system of mandatory voting versus countries that just have a better culture of encouraging it, you know, the fact of the matter is, the more people that vote, the more dynamic your political process is. And our political process is stuck. Again, I, this is dishonorable, stuck in the mud. I mean, it is not functioning. And we are leaving big issues off the table for too long a period of time. And so expanding that electorate is critical. But I will suggest to you, in close, that I think the right to vote amendment is critical to expanding the electorate. Because the fact of the matter is, as we were just saying here, when you expand the electorate, people get scared. And some of them are Democrats. And some of them are Republicans, and at different times in history, it has gone back and forth. And the fact of the matter is, whichever, whoever gets scared by an expanding electorate, I don't want them to be able to act on their fears. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Any, any other thoughts on that, or any last thoughts that anybody from the... Tim, do you want to, you, you've been a little quiet in this uh, <laughs> last round. Do you want to... Um, last thoughts? Here? You know, I guess a last thought on this particular question, and I lived in Australia for five years. Um, and appreciated their universal health care as well, <laughs> uh, including for non-citizens. Um, you know, one of the big barriers that we see in Tacoma Park and local elections is off-year elections. So uh, between uh, 2011, 2012, 50% or more drop. Um, the argument raised is, well, it's quality over quantity. Uh, I'd love to see on a ballot the simple, simple thing, for example, you know, county judges, there's just so many questions on a ballot. I don't know enough to make a choice. Mm. If, we had, and I don't know enough to make a choice on that ballot, and we could switch from off year to, to um, the general national state elections, that would be a big improvement. And we would see more opportunity to get that turnout there, even if people weren't making a choice. At the end of the day, they were ticking, I don't know enough to make a choice. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, I want to thank uh, all the panelists. I think this was a fascinating uh, discussion, especially as we got a little more uh, give and take. And I, and I guess I want to join again in thanking uh, Rob and Fairvote and, and everybody who, who works at Fairvote for uh, not just taking on this issue, but, but integrating it and connecting it to so many other democracy issues and getting beyond that sort of siloing where different democracy issues are kind of the work of the individual groups and so forth. I mean, you really do more than anybody, I think, to give us that broad perspective on, on what democracy can mean and should mean. And uh, I think we all admire that tremendously. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks to the panel. Um, and uh, just a couple things of business. Uh, and one is this is part of a, a series of forums. So the next one is July 25th. We'll be taking on presidential elections. Uh, we'll have uh, one of the leaders of the national popular vote effort which is just this week getting its next win in Rhode Island, uh, which has become the next state that's, uh, we're up to 10, um, counting DC, that have uh, uh, passed the national popular vote plan for president and remains in play to be in for 2016. We'll also have some people who have been deeply involved in the nomination rules about the 2006 presidential nomination. So we'll be talking both about sort of what might change in primaries and what might change in the general election and continue to some discussion uh, with the, uh, one of the, the writer of the book on electoral dysfunction about what voting changes might mean for the, the battlegrounds in 2016. Then on August uh, 19th, we're uh, having a forum on the state of women's representation. Um, and it's the first report of what will be an annual uh, release about women's representation heading toward 2020, which will be the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and women's suffrage, um, and uh, saying it's now time for a representation movement uh, to, to build on the suffrage movement and, and, and looking at, at, at actual women's representation. We'll have a very good uh, forum for that. Um, I'll uh, say for, during the reception, we'll have uh, various fair vote people uh, as resources to talk about. Patty will, will be able to, to talk about promote our vote. Uh, Liz, uh, you want to wave your hand? We'll be talking about our, our advocacy work, um, fair vote action, and uh, the, the range of things that we do. And Molly Haley. We'll, next to her will be, uh, she just did a, a great policy brief about some of the specifics about what a, a constitutional right to vote would mean, some language, some implications of different language, and if you have those kinds of questions, they will be available to talk. Maybe all the fair vote people, uh, which will suddenly expose how many of you are here, um, can raise your hand. Interns and, 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 and staff, board members, great, a lot of people. <laughs> so, uh, so just find them during, during the reception. I'll, I'll say as a final word to, what, to some of the great uh, discussion that went on here is that I think lifting our, our aspirations toward dreams is so important. It becomes very practical at certain opportunities for change. In 2009, we, do, we did have a president getting elected who started his constitutional law classes with a discussion about the fact that there wasn't a right to vote in the Constitution, uh, Barack Obama. Um, total wonk about voting issues, has, has sponsored bills on cumulative voting for the, the state legislature in Illinois to do instant runoff voting in primaries. Um, and uh, obviously, as a community organizer, had worked on voting. A lot of the new members of Congress had worked on voting. And the, the Congress did almost nothing on voting uh, in, 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 at a time when you would think that they might have, uh, you know, that, that they might actually. And, and I think part of it is that people get in a defensive crouch when we talked about sort of the the opposition of this, I think some of it is that people sort of are worried almost about the discussion creating a climate that people realize we don't have a right to vote and start taking advantage of that as if that might not already be happening. And I think that, 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 that having a, ref, a, a, a big vision leads to, to big change and it can be worked on, on locally. And so check out our 2020 reform vision about the full range of things that we hope to do. And I think each member of this panel is, is really furthering that big vision with their work too. So I wanted to thank them again, so. Hey, see you at the reception.